Hello, one, two, one, two. Is that it? Yeah, is that, can you hear that? Excellent. Yeah, that's, is that the one that's going out? That's there, okay. Boom. I should be able to do that. Yeah. Which I nine pictures, and we'll sort of talk for a minute on each of them. Um, three of them I'm not going to show because they're sort of shit. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So off you go, Heath. Well, I'll talk about the background for this first. I'm from a charity called Future Leaders. We train senior leaders from challenging schools. We've got about 380 now working across the country. About 35 of them have gone on to headship. So I asked some of our heads, what advice would you give senior leaders? Um, and you're not allowed because it's a kind of light-hearted, relaxed evening. You're not allowed to mention Ofsted or Raise Online. <laughs> so each of one has got a photo and because I can't time how long I'm going to speak for, Stephen's going to give me the photos and I'll talk about them. So the first one is Albus Dumbledore and the first piece of advice they gave me was get yourself a mentor. Get yourself somebody that you can talk to outside of your school whose opinion you trust, who you can rely on, who isn't your life partner because your life partner will not appreciate you coming home night after night complaining about what such and such a teacher in year eight said what the unions are up to and the difficulty you're having with all sorts of classes. Second picture, a present, a gift. We talk about future leaders that feedback is a gift and it links to the last presentation about growth mindset. If you have a growth mindset, you seek out and you welcome feedback because it helps you to improve. If you have a fixed mindset, you avoid feedback because it tells you you're not very good at something. As a senior leader, the most important thing you can do is to seek out feedback all the time and also to offer it to others. How many times a day do you say, can I give you some feedback? The other part of gifts is give people gifts as well, real gifts. Postcards, little presents, chocolates, anything to say thank you. You should have seen your leaders, they told me, say thank you all of the time. This one's a ticket to Rochdale. I'm not advising that anyone goes to Rochdale, um, but I am saying get out of your school. Go and visit other schools as much as you can. Um, senior leaders have said to us, you always learn something if you go to another school, whether it's an outstanding school, whether it's a school in special measures, get out, see other practices, learn from other schools, find out what they're doing, find if there's something that you can take back. It's a fantastic learning experience. And if you can't do it in the real world, do it in the virtual world. Events like this, getting on Twitter, finding out what's going on and never being complacent in your practice. This is a, a sort of standard web picture of a, a happy family. Um, senior leaders, certainly our senior leaders, work incredibly hard. I'm sure you do. And the, the demands on your time are excessive. 70, 80 hour weeks can often become a regularity. But what happens at home is really, really important because that's where you're centered. Your hobbies, your friends, your family, if you neglect them, you do so at your peril because you run the risk of burnout. So for all our senior leaders, we say, Make time for the things that are important to you and keep that tank for sanct, whatever's happening at school. This is a ruler. Measure something. I was listening to um, Peter earlier talking about his work at Q3 and I thought, he said he's hit a brick wall. I bet he hasn't. I bet there's loads of stuff that's happened since he's been there doing teaching and learning. But the difficulty is when everything's very busy and you're rushed off your feet, do you know? And you can measure loads of things through surveys. We talked about Survey Monkey from Google Forms. Just find out what's going on and say, well, this is better than it was before. And in those dark days in November when you're really exhausted, saying, well, actually 20% more of classes have the learning objectives written up before the lesson is a really positive thing for you and it's a positive thing for your governors and for your line management meetings. <laughs> shoes. Get good shoes. 
really good shoes. If you're a senior leader, you shouldn't be in your office. You should be out and about around the school. And the more you're walking, the better shoes you need. Um, one of our senior leaders said when he goes to a new school and he's been to a several new schools, on the first day he stands at the gate, he goes to Lost Property and he gets a hooded sweatshirt. The school has a uniform policy that they couldn't wear hooded sweatshirts. Stands with his over his arm and the kids just started giving him their sweatshirts as they came in. He's always out and about. The more you're out and about, the more you develop credibility, the more people will trust you. You have that presence. Don't stay in your office. Walk. How are we doing? Tesco values. This is about values. It's not about Tesco's. <laughs> Work out what your values are and stick to them. If you have been a school leader for them many years, you'll have believed that BTECs were the best thing since sliced bread, then it's five agencies including English and maths, now it's EBAC. You'll be driven stark staring mad by government because they change their minds every 20 minutes. Work out what it is that you believe in, what's really important to you, and talk about it a lot and stick to it all the time. A pen. Right. We talk a lot about reflection. Reflection's really hard to do because it's hard to carve out time for reflection. But if you write, write a blog, write a journal, publish it. Um, there's fantastic opportunities now through Twitter, through social media, just to tell your story and you'll be amazed how much you get out of that process of writing down what you're doing, what you're experiencing, putting it on paper. You don't have to share it, but if you want to, there's lots of people that would love to read it and it really helps you reflect. And last, perhaps most important, smile. Try and stay optimistic. Schools are incredibly tough places. It's incredibly hard to be a senior leader when things are going wrong, when the unions are working to rule, when teachers are upset, when kids are angry, when parents are screaming at your door. But if you can stay smiling, then you've got a chance. It is just the most fantastic job in the world. So why not enjoy it? Thank you. That's fine. No, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> right, good. Put it in there. I've never had a microphone in a pack like that before. It's a whole new experience for me. Okay, I'd like to complain about the previous speaker who has done a large part of what I'm going to say. <laughs> so, uh, so this is supposed to be random, but I feel I've been stitched up. So um, when I said I'd do a speech, I thought actually the mo thing I can most talk about at the moment is actually the fact that I've only been a head teacher since September. And obviously I really wanted to do it. And it was my dream from day one of teaching, and it took me 15 years. I said I'd do it by the time I was 40, and I managed it with two months to spare. So, good, that's the F, I, I prefer that one. So, I thought I would talk about 10 things that I thought were really important for those of you who still aspire to be ahead on the grounds that I've kind of done the successful interview fairly recently. So, my first one is you have to really want it. If you don't think you're ready to do it, and you don't think you want it, then don't bother because you're not. Okay, because you have to really want it. Doesn't matter what job you're currently doing, you might think you're good at your deputy job, assistant job, but if you don't really want to be the person at the top, then actually you're probably not ready for it. You need to do another year, another two years, and then be ready for it, and you will know. I think it's a bit like when you know you're ready to get married or you're ready to have children. It will never actually happen, you can't plan it. So you have to really want it. I think that's the first thing I would say. Secondly, seek the comments of everyone. Ask the people who you line manage who drive you up the wall how good you are. Because when you are the head and you have to have someone line managing them and those people are gonna make your life difficult and you need to motivate them and it isn't somebody else in that office, you need to know what they think. You might think you're really good at the things that you do, people might give you good feedback, but are you asking the right people? Because when you're the head, you can't just hide. You can't just palm that department off on someone else which maybe you can do when it isn't you. So you need to ask everyone's advice. Ask the difficult children, ask the challenging parents. Are you actually really good at doing things? And be ready to have the arrows. Okay, third one, ensure your experience is wide. You might be brilliant on your SLT at the things that you've done, 
but have you ever actually done the stuff to do with child protection? Have you ever done the stuff to do with finance? Have you ever done the stuff that the other bits of the SLT are brilliant at doing? Because if you haven't, once you're the head, you're going to have to do it. And I know you can get other people to do it a bit, but you need to have wide experience. So as you're getting ready to do it, volunteer for the jobs that you least like. Okay, decide what your school will look like. My picture of that is related to grand designs. I feel that you need to feel you're like the person with your grand design. You know exactly what your plan is, but that person's going to come in and he's going to pick it apart the entire time. Your governors, your parents, your children, your teachers are going to pull your vision to pieces every single day, but you need to stick with it. You have to know what you want your school to look like, which means that you are ready. When you go for your interview, have a vision ready to communicate. Don't be the person who goes to the interview and isn't ready to do it. Why? No, I don't have to have extra time. No, I know. I know. Challenge him. Right, okay. Please tell everyone in your local authority you're looking for a job because if you don't, you might miss out on it. I got my job, I think, partly because I told everyone in the local authority I wanted it and they told me when the jobs were coming up. I know that's a bit inside knowledge, but I think it's important. Um, don't apply for every single job that comes up, especially within one local authority, because local authority advisors talk to head teachers and chair of governors, and you start to get a reputation as somebody who just wants the job, who doesn't want a specific school. People get found out. Okay. Next one, research everything possible. The stuff that is in the back page of the paper of the local school might be the thing that gets you the job. And if you've spent time researching, that might make the difference. I knew nothing about Brentwood before I applied for the job. I spent months reading everything in advance. Number nine, have some plans ready to go. I think the government at the moment call it shovel-ready stuff, where they say they can spend money straight away and do it. Have something you can tell the governors that you will do straight away. It doesn't have to be massive. It could be small. Have something ready so you look like you know what you're doing. And my last one is believe in yourself. Be honest, be humble, be powerful. You want to be in charge. You want to be the head. You have to have a bit of arrogance about you. You have to believe in yourself. Don't be the person who sounds really good but actually goes to pieces. Be honest, be humble, be powerful. You want to make a difference. I apologise for going over. I'm just waiting for my presentation to... Oh, sorry. <laughs> this one that's got the Elliott Foundation at the front. <laughs> I sent it in. I sent it to both of you. You and Stephen. I sent it to you. Do you want, why don't you put somebody else first in then, yeah? I've got mine. I happen to have it on my netbook. Yeah, got, give me a USB and I'll copy it. So here you go. Yeah, no, I emailed it the other day, so. Evening everyone, I'm Bill Watkin from SSAT. I'm not going to talk to you about current practice, I'm going to talk to you about things that are coming your way, I think. I'm going to talk about the assessment reforms, the proposals to change Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5 in the context of significant challenges facing schools at the moment. I'm not going to deal with all of those now because we haven't got time, but I am going to talk about the EB, the IB, the TB and the AB, which are all coming our way. And I'm going to talk about one particular element of those at the moment, and that's the terminal exam. 
the notion that the best way to assess a child's learning, in fact, the only way to assess a child's learning, is to wait for a couple of years, make them do masses of revision, stick them in a hall and make them do a long written paper and then send the paper off to someone who's never met that child who will be able to identify the level of progress made, the level of attainment reached and the future potential of that child for further study. <laughs> the other thing that I think we need to be conscious of when talking about the assessment framework is the raising the participation age. So it's going to go up to 17 in 2013, 18 in 2015. And I hope you've all done your modeling. You've worked out how many extra students you're anticipating in your sixth form, whether you've got enough toilets to accommodate them and catering facilities to feed them, whether you can afford the teachers and the classrooms to accommodate them and teach them. So we're talking about reforms to the proposals. I don't think any of us would argue about the need to have reformed and more rigorous qualifications. You have unfortunately been colluding with the exam boards in this race to the bottom, we understand from the Secretary of State, and that means that you have been choosing specifications that are the easiest ones to pass, and the exam boards, which are commercial organisations looking to sell a product, have been creating easy to pass specifications, and that has created this devaluing of GCSEs in a race to the bottom. So the way to address that is to have one subject, one board. So if you're going to do English, you get it from Edexcel. If you're going to do maths, you get it from AQA and so on. And that's going on right now. The exam boards are busy writing their specifications for the EBCs, and they must have their bids in by June 2013. So that's only seven months away. The two criteria for awarding the contracts to the boards, one, they must have five years successful delivery of exams, not many exam boards could lay claim to that at the moment. <laughs> and the second criterion is that the bid will be, the successful bid will be the most ambitious one. So what does an ambitious bid mean? It probably means difficult, so we no longer have a race to the bottom, we have a race to the top. So you've got these EBCs, which are subject level qualifications, with the EB, which is the overarching cluster qualification. Unless you're not up to doing the EBCs, in which case you do a statement of achievement. And a statement of achievement is a school-level piece of work that is drawn up by the school, ad identifying the level of attainment reached by each child in each subject. Let's just hope that it's not presented in a burgundy-coloured folder. The students who do not pass their EBCs at 16 can go on to do them at 17 or 18 which means that you've got to make decisions about what you're going to offer in your sixth form. You're going to have to do English and maths resits because you don't get the funding for the children unless you do, unless the children are entered for it. You're also going to have to consider doing resits in all the other English back subjects because your school may be judged by how many kids you get through the English back. And if you're going to do all these resits in history and geography and French and so on, how many A-levels are the children going to be able to study alongside these resits? And just to make things more interesting, we've got to make absolutely sure that we restrict teacher assessment because you can't trust teachers to get it right, of course. So in subjects that matter, no teacher assessment. In subjects that don't matter, it may be that you can have some teacher assessment. Have you noticed this, uh, this emerging hierarchy of subjects? Some subjects matter considerably more than others. So English and maths really matter. Science matters a little bit less than English and maths, but a lot more than all the others. History and geography matter slightly less than science and rather more less than English and maths, but a lot more than all the other subjects that don't matter. But in the subjects that don't matter, there are some that matter slightly more than the others. <laughs> so engineering matters more than all the other subjects that don't matter, but it doesn't matter as much as the subjects that really matter. <laughs> and of course, what we've got to make sure is that we remove opportunities to teach the test. So what we don't want is having passed papers, examiners' reports, mark schemes. It's really important that we don't understand how testing works. <laughs> and finally, in the 21st century, we've got to make absolutely sure that children don't use calculators in maths exams, periodic tables in science, set texts in English or source materials in history. But what the English back will do, and I think we would all agree it should do, is identify the literacy and numeracy levels of the children, their understanding of the subject, or does that mean the content of the subject, 
and the readiness to move on to further study. So it is definitely going to happen. This is not a proposal. 2015, English, Math and Science will come in. First assessment, 2017. So what are you going to do if you've got a three-year uh, key stage four, two-year key stage three, and sometimes some of your students do their GCSEs currently in year 10? What are you going to do in 2016 for those children? Are you going to enter them early, or are you going to make them do a three-year key stage four and do EBCs rather than these worthless bits of paper called GCSEs? They've got to be aligned to the best international standards, whatever that means. We are obviously unfavorably compared with Finland, who think we're completely bonkers, because having an almost uniquely white, monocultural, middle-class society, they wonder what it is that we could learn from them. We're also compared unfavorably with Singapore that are busy unpicking a lot of what they've done for the last 10 years because it hasn't worked. And it's got to be an almost universal qualification, which 90% of our school population will be eligible for. And we certainly don't want tiering, because tiering represents a ceiling on attainment and is demotivating if you're entered for the foundation paper. So we want a single paper that will be suitable for children of all abilities from the most able to the least able. Key stage five, the ABAC introduced. Uh, I won't say a huge amount about that, except you need to know that it's contrasting subjects if you're going to get the ABAC. You can't do English, Math, Physics and Chemistry. You've got to do English, Math, Physics and Drama. <laughs> Veterinary colleges will be looking forward to that. Huge implications for pedagogy, for data and so on and so on. And I've got to stop now. Thank you very much. It's really weird not being able to uh, see what I'm doing here. Oh yeah, of course. Right, okay, ready. Oh no, that's not right, there we go. Right, um, hello everyone, I'm Rachel Jones. I'm uh, Education Director at the Elliott Foundation. Uh, just a bit on my background first. I've spent about 20 years in schools. I've been a head teacher, worked in local authority, done inspection work, spent six years in the technologies industry. And now I find myself at the Elliott Foundation looking at how we build learning and CPD.